Professor Ahmed Banafa, and some of you are actually in my uh, in my uh, lab, in Engineering uh, Ten Lab. So welcome to all of you to the to this wonderful presentation. Uh, today, I, I would like to introduce a, a very special speaker. He is uh, well known in the industry, and also he's a good friend. Uh, Eric Severton is a founder and CEO of the Quantum Trace. It's an IoT Internet of Things security company and they're located in Palo Alto. A little bit about the background of Eric. I'm gonna talk about his formal background and then I give you some take on uh, knowing him for many years. Uh, Eric uh, earned his bachelor degree in electrical engineering from a, uh, from, from a prestigious university, Virginia uh, Polytechnic Institute and, and state universities. So, so uh, he, has, uh, he has a very strong background in the, in the hardware part of, the, uh, uh, of this field. Uh, in 2006, uh, Eric joined uh, Xilinx, the famous uh, you know, company here in the Silicon Valley, the aerospace division and, uh, and business unit. Uh, he worked at, uh, as a general manager for three years. Then he went to a company called Contron, where he worked for two years as the executive vice uh, president of avionics and transportation and defense. Uh, during that time, he ran a, you know, a corporate business development business and uh, product strategy, sales, marketing, sales support, program management, and more. In 2015, end of 2015, uh, Eric started his you know, uh, own company. It's called Quantum Trace, and uh, which he uh, ensured the security of data generated by machine to machine in the IoT operations. Basically, what, he, what we're talking about here, the focus in the industry is on the software. He's focusing on the hardware, which is a very tough area. Uh, but knowing Eric for many years, I know he's doing a good job with that. Uh, once again, uh, please help me welcome Eric, the founder and the CEO of Quantum Trace. Thank you, Ahmed. That was very kind. Very kind words and uh, enjoyed uh, reading many of your posts over the years and, and, and talking with you and being at many of your classes previously. Um, you're a real asset there for San Jose State. So thank all of you for having me. Um, can, can everyone hear me? I, I should have probably asked that first. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, so today I, it's labeled cyber security for executives. This is kind of a presentation I usually give to executives or high level people to understand um, really what, what I'm going to give you more information on cyber resiliency and hardware trust. And, and this is really critical to uh, kind of what's evolving in the, in the cybersecurity world, if you will. Uh, oops, let's see if we can make this. There we go. Um, so uh, my company, uh, we're, like uh, Ahmed said, we're located uh, right off of 101 in Palo Alto. So we're awesome. in the area. Uh, I actually, I founded, yeah, I founded the company in 2000. Oh, oh, oh. Can you mute? Uh, good. Yeah, thank you. And you can still hear me, right? Still good? Okay, yeah. Um, so uh, I actually founded the company, uh, a version of it in 2009 and took a, a little bit of a, a sabbatical to, to do the Contron job. And I, I actually sometimes do contract positions for companies. So it, 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 it varies. Um, and uh, we're privately funded. I'm the main funder. Uh, like I said, our office is there in Palo Alto. And we do a lot on uh, security trusted systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you know, my background, uh, I've, I've done a lot as a, both an engineer, entrepreneur, and executive. Um, I've built up lots of teams, and I have a really deep understanding technically in FPGAs, IoT, and embedded systems. That's kind of my specialty um, in applying security to that. Prior to coming to California, I did a lot of work in the um, U.S. defense and intelligence community. So just to give you more of my background. Um, <clears throat> the business itself, we focus on uh, secure IP, intellectual property, uh, that goes both into, uh, you know, chips as well as into uh, soft chips, FPGAs, mobile gate arrays. A um, lot of consulting work that we do. We do testing and implementation uh, efforts so we can help do uh, pen testing, side channel analysis, things like that. And the new focus area uh, for us is, is really in machine learning and artificial intelligence applied to security. So that's kind of what the, myself and the company are about. Um, and I wanted to now kind of get into the meat of what I think will be interesting for you today. And that's a, a term you may or may not have heard of called cyber resiliency. 
you've probably all heard of cybersecurity, but maybe not a lot about cyber resiliency. And so cyber resiliency is about being able to uh, continuously deliver an outcome despite adverse cyber uh, events. And so you think of cybersecurity as just protecting things, uh, that's one element, but a lot of the problem today really is denial of service. You've probably heard of that quite a bit. So availability of systems when they're needed, um, being able to, you know, if a site is being attacked, can it continue to operate? Well, this is also going to be uh, not just at a software or network level. This comes into play heavily when we start to think about automated vehicles, we think about robots, we think about things that have to continuously operate that are gonna be kind of uh, autonomous. Uh, you don't wanna deny their service, right? Imagine denial of service of a Tesla at high speed, that's not a good situation, right? So that's really what cyber resiliency is all about. And the implications for that on, um, oh, excuse me, mute my phone here. What happened with that? That was weird. Um, the implications. Yeah, sorry about that. Don't know what's causing my phone to make all that noise. <laughs> um, the impl Yeah, I do apologize. I have no clue what that is. I'm just going to turn my phone off. That'll keep it from making noise. Um, the implications for silicon solutions and systems really is a concept that, I, that I've termed dynamic trust, and that's this ability to really respond to attacks um, in a trusted way on multiple channels simultaneously and in real time. You also are going to have to have continuous protections and trust, always on, always available, always reactive. Um, and then this is really important. I'm going to go a lot of detail about hardware roots of trust because this is probably a new concept for a lot of people, especially if you're mostly from a software perspective. Um, these are going to be mandated in all systems that will become cyber resilient. And you'll understand that in a few minutes. Um, and then there are a lot of nation state level programs being sponsored around cyber resilience. Uh, in the U.S., um, there's a, a framework called Cyber, cyber Resiliency uh, Framework that, that came into place. And one of the first components of it is what's called the uh, Platform Firmware Resiliency, or PFR. And this is a NIST guideline. Uh, the number on it is NIST 800-193. And it really is being adopted right now. It's not a uh, standard yet, but it is being adopted. The guidelines are being adopted in most server platforms uh, around the world. And uh, at the Trusted Computing Group, and if you're familiar with modules called TPMs, Trusted Platform Modules, um, the Trusted Computing Group is the industry body that uh, made that an industry standard. They have a group called Cyber Resilient Technologies or CIRES, and they're gonna standardize effectively this PFR. And uh, PFR, the simple concepts of it are protect, detect, and recover. So again, on the cyber resiliency side of things, it can protect, which is typical of what you hear in cybersecurity, um, but it can detect. And again, this comes to all those other terminologies I was telling you about, the, the real-time nature, um, being able to detect an attack as it's happening. Uh, if you throw an AI component to it, you can start to predict when the attack happens. And then this is the part you probably don't hear a lot about, and that's really the heart of uh, resiliency, and that's recover. So it's protect, detect, and recover. So under any type of attack, you can know it's happening, um, you can take appropriate actions, and you can recover the system. And so this is really the future of cybersecurity, the cyber resiliency component. Um, your cryptography and all of that, those are basic components, but now it's being able to operate in a hostile environment and still keep doing your job and stay protected and trusted. So <clears throat> you may or may not have heard of some of these terms, but uh, you know, my goal today was to kind of enlighten, enlighten folks on all of that. And so I'm gonna give you just a brief history lesson to help see why this is occurring. In, in old days, and old days being, you know, when I was a kid, I date myself, but uh, in the beginning days of, of really what I would call enterprise computing, moving towards personal computers, the security paradigm was uh, a guns, guards, and gates philosophy, kind of like a castle, if you will. Uh, hard to get into, hard to penetrate those systems, right? 
And so you had controlled physical access by trusted personnel. Um, you had a, a very well-defined security perimeter, the castle, if you will. Um, the uh, humans that administered it were all cleared and trusted people. You have high connectivity, you know, it's uh, the triple nines, no downtime on a, on a data center inside a facility, uh, and very strong authentication protocols that were evolved over many years. And so that's really the old paradigm of security. And you still see it at a data center. You still see it at the hub of cloud computing. Um, however, we really are moving to a whole new world. And that's why the cyber resiliency is important. So the new world um, is what I classify as perimeterless, right? It's exposed, vulnerable, you know, unprotected. And I like to use Tesla as kind of my um, poster child. You know, it's 100% electric. It's got software updates over the air. It's easy to access. It's easy to penetrate. Um, it's a very different world, right? That, you know, we don't know who's going to get access to that car. You park it on the street, you know, anyone can get access to it. And so this new paradigm is uncontrolled access by untrusted humans. We don't know who's really getting into these devices. Very decentralized, very distributed environment. It's not in a, a castle. It's all over the place. Um, automated and non-human administration. A lot of these are, are with their own computers deciding when to do updates. Um, you have sporadic connectivity. You're not always with a, with a connection back into a, a cloud environment. So you, you don't have the ability to constantly monitor something that in these, you know, what I'd call the guns, guards, and gates model, the centralized data centers, you don't have that. Um, you don't have power failure protection. Your battery goes dead. The system's down. Well, that could be a, that could be a place to be exploited, um, and and really no broadly distributed policy tools and operating systems built to deal with this, right? Um, and the authentication mechanisms are just coming online. So this is why cyber resiliency, why trust at a fundamental hardware level are going to become more and more critical because of all these attacks that can take place in this highly distributed yet uh, strong compute foundation. And so <clears throat> I'm gonna give you a good example, which is what I would call, uh, you know, uh, firmware risk and data centers, uh, both the public and the private cloud. Um, Gartner uh, last year came out with a report that 70% of organizations by 2022, you know, less than two years from now, are going to get breached if they don't deal with the problems of firmware vulnerability, right? Um, and this is back to my point about these operating systems aren't really there strongly. And for most organizations, they never thought about firmware. They've always thought these things will be in protected environments. So the concern's always been on the software, not on the hardware side. Um, and this picture here gives you a good idea of it, that if you go like to the RSA convention, which is happening in May next year at the Moscone Center, uh, the bulk of basically protection solutions are at this software level, app level, right? They're not down at the firmware level. So there's not even mechanisms in organizations to test firmware. And so to fix that, you're gonna to need to have truly hardware roots of trust that you can do secure measured boots and signed firmware updates. I'm gonna show you what that, you know, a kind of a notional picture of how this works and how this not only protects you at the hardware level, but then becomes a kind of a, uh, a little guns, guards and gates at a silicon chip level to fend off these attacks and really become cyber resilient, if you will. <clears throat> uh, and I was telling you about that NIST standard, this platform firmware resiliency is becoming a bigger and bigger thing that's going to be tied to it. Uh, if you look at the supply chain today, this is where a lot of these firmware attacks can take place. So there was a report by Verizon on data breaches again last year um, and really started to hit the point that, you know, you've got to look at your supply chain at the firmware level if you're going to fix these problems. And 50% of the manufacturers they surveyed had experienced a breach, basically. Um, so the bad guys, you know, they, they take the easy path. And when they look at the network layer, they look at the app layer, they look at the OS layer, there's a lot of protections in place. But when they look at the supply chain and they look at the firmware layer, it's the Wild West. You know, it's an invitation for, for miscreants and malfeasance, as I like to say. Um, now, this is a, a 
this lady was uh, in charge of uh, the Department of Homeland Security, uh, <coughs> security, uh, if, if you will, policies. And uh, this was pre-COVID, and it's got to be careful with your words these days after COVID, but she called it a digital public health crisis, what's happening basically with uh, the supply chain. Um, and then this is a very interesting attack. It's called Zombie Zero. And this is where hackers, uh, this was nation state sponsored. It's believed to be nation state sponsored. They still haven't put all the, all the um, smoking guns out there, but all signs point to a nation state sponsored event where an actual contract manufacturer was paid, sponsored by a nation state with a group of hackers paid and sponsored by a nation state to put a back door into little hand scanners that are used in most enterprises to go and, and basically read bar labels as uh, they're, they're bringing in inventory into their logistics system. And the benefit of doing the hack at this level, and it was done at the firmware level, it was done basically beneath the Windows embedded operating system. And it was done by hackers, made by nation state, and injected into the product at the contract manufacturing site where the products were manufactured. And they did it because they knew that these hand scanners were going to be behind the firewall inside, you know, Fortune 100 and 500 organizations. So by making the attack there, they didn't have to try to find a way to get through the firewall to break into all of the ERP systems of most of these uh, large organizations. And so it's a very interesting attack. It's worth taking a look at. Um, and had the these devices had really strong cyber resiliency and also had really strong hardware roots of trust and good firmware protections, all the things you get with that, that NIST PFR standard I was telling you about, this could not have happened. But because it wasn't there, um, a backdoor was planted in almost every major uh, company's ERP system to be uh, used to exfiltrate information and data out of those companies um, because of this problem. So it's a big deal. And, uh, and then if you look at uh, a lot of the servers, this is what drove PFR, that, that, that NIST PFR standard. There have been a significant amount of vulnerabilities found inside of BMC firmware, again, it's firmware, and the BMC is a baseband uh, protection module and control module for all servers. So if a server chip fails, you, won't, you have an out-of-band way to go in and reboot the system and update the system. It's also a great vector for bad guys to come in independent of all of the network application and um, OS controls and backdoor in and update the firmware on a system and put in Trojans. And this thing is full of holes and all kinds of problems have come from that. So, you know, the, the evidence is there. It doesn't make as much mainstream, but there's a tremendous amount of activity in this space taking place. And now coupled to that, I'm gonna call this part of this perfect storm is the attack on hardware devices because it's easy to go at this firmware level. And so there were uh, known vulnerabilities found in pacemakers, super easy to go in and imagine what damage can be done by getting in at the firmware level on a pacemaker. There's some famous hacks um, by uh, Charlie Miller uh, on Jeeps, right? Where they were able to, from an external system, get inside and literally take controls of the Jeep, cause it to run off the road, cause it to break, cause it not to break, you know, some pretty bad stuff, right? Um, they found a tremendous amount of control systems in Europe. They set up honeypots, found tons of these control systems that do manufacturing, were very vulnerable. And then one of the biggest hacks, and most people have never heard of this one, and this was quite a few years ago, but again, this was a, a low-level attack where they broke into a smelting factory in Germany. This is where they melt steel and shut down the firmware controls that, that were able to control the sequence of, of how you cool down the steel to stop it from being a problem. And so by, by doing it the way they did, they, they, they couldn't stop the steel basically from overflowing, boiling over. Imagine a pot on your stove getting too hot. So I think at the end, it was either a billion or $3 billion in damages. Effectively, you had bubbling steel pour out of the kettles and flow all over the entire factory, the whole smelting floor, and turn into a big chunk of steel. So they had to rebuild the entire system. And that was a very simple attack um, from the outside that did that. So, uh, and, and then uh, Stuxnet's a famous one. Everyone's familiar with that one. So, so this stuff is all real and it's a big problem. This is why this cyber resiliency and this hardware roots of trust is a big deal. 
um, and then the you know infrastructure and uh, power grid. Uh, you know, Russians pulled a number on Ukraine, and uh, there's a there's a paper by Lloyd's of London on you know what would happen if the United States power grid really got attacked, and it would be in the in the trillion dollar range of damages. And they actually estimated the probability of loss of life coming from it would be high. So it's kind of scary and it's amazing. I think it tells you most of humanity is kind of good in that we haven't had some really bad things happen, but everything's there for it to occur. And most of it right now is not nation state warlike. It's more hackers trying to extract money, you know, ransomware, things like that. But everything's in place for bigger problems. So that's why this cyber resiliency, that's where hardware roots of trust are going to become very, very critical in the long run. And so each of these systems that I just talked about all had cryptographic capability. They all had what you probably think of as security, which is cryptography. But here's the problem. Cryptography by itself is not sufficient to build trust because I just showed you these examples. Many solutions masquerade as if that's all it's needed, but it isn't. You really need a trusted foundation in order for the cryptography to work. And that's also critical for this cyber resiliency. Trust is a big, big part of it. So when you think about how the cloud gets to a device, because everything's becoming connected, uh, you, you need to have this foundational trust. And these hardware roots of trust are key to it. And that's at the silicon level and the chips inside your devices. When you get that, then you can do um, some really cool things. You can have unquestionable device authentication. So as the cloud and as decision components in a cloud environment or cyberspace, if you want, talk to one another, they can establish a trusted path. They can confirm that is truly the device they think they're talking to, not a device that's spoofing them. They can have secure channels of communication established. You can now do secure updates. You can attest. That means you can, you can ask query of the device, you know, are you who you say you are and are you authorized to do what I think you can? And you can shut things down. You can deauthorize or reauthorize when they are not. But you can't do this if you don't have a foundational hardware um, root of trust. And so I want to give you kind of a picture of what does that look like at a, uh, what I'd call notional view. So if you think of a uh, a system which would be the silicon device and all the software writing on it as kind of a sphere. That outer shell of the sphere is the application layer. And that's typically where a lot of the attacks happen. And there's a lot of tools, like I said, at RSA to help you protect yourself from that. But then as you drill down, you're, you'll see that what does the application layer ride on? It's usually riding on an operating system. And in today's virtual world, you know, you could replace this with a virtual machine, but it's the same concept in that your application code and the operating system to enable it to really run are the first target for the bad guys. And this is usually where most of your attacks are occurring. But like I just showed you, as you go down further, what brings all that up is a firmware layer. So from a software point of view, to even get to this layer, you got to have the firmware that wakes all the system up and gives even some of the lower level calls into the hardware capability for these upper layers to work. So imagine now the assumption for all these years is you can trust that, that that's okay. But because of the connectivity, because of the supply chain uh, issues I was showing you, that's not a trusted place anymore. It has to have trust inherently itself. And that's where a lot of the attacks occur. So the foundation of everything you think is secure is totally attackable and it is being attacked in a big way. And so if you think of this in a sphere, you think of these outer shells, that's the software side. But that all has to ride on a piece of hardware. There's a piece of silicon somewhere in the, in the system where this stuff runs. And when you get to that, you're gonna find that the upper layer of that thing is its device functionality. You know, if it's a microcomputer, microcontroller, you know, it's a it's basically a, a von Neumann, you know, architected instruction set machine. Um, but usually inside there is going to be your cryptographic services, a coprocessor, something like that. And then finally, at the base of all of it, if it's built properly, and this is what the future is going to demand, is a root of trust. And that root of trust is an unclonable, unspoofable, and unforgeable identity, right? It's, it's like your fingerprint or your DNA, but it's done at a silicon device level. 
And there's some things called uh, physical unclonable functions or PUFFs. And they're actually where they measure defects in the manufacturing processes of silicon dyes. And when you think about it, uh, you probably think all integrated circuits are identical, perfectly the same. At a macroscopic level, that is true. But when you get down to the microscopic or even the quantum level, <clears throat> you're going to find that there are defects in how these devices get made. And each one has some unique features. They're like, kind of like a snowflake. And so with a puff, you can measure that and actually get a very unique cryptographic value at an individual silicon dye level. And the power of that from being able to basically make a, a trusted system is huge. Because with that physical unclonable function, you now cannot trick a device. You can't have two pieces of silicon the same and replace one with another. Uh, if you're using a proper authentication mechanism at this lower level, it's going to fail authentication because it's not the same fingerprint. It's not the same device. And this shuts down a tremendous amount of attacks and builds a foundation of trust for everything to, to basically form on top of. This little area here where the services and that root of trust happen, that's where I focus a lot of my practice. This is where my IP, my consulting, and, and you know, I, in a past life where I attacked. This is the area where I help uh, my clients really determine how to do that right and how to be prepared for the future and how to fend off all these miscreants and bad guys. Um, and so if you get that right, now we can come over here and at this firmware layer, which is going to be foundational for everything else, we can vet it, we can protect it, we can authenticate it, and we can ensure that nothing starts up until we know that's genuine. And the device itself is that guns, guards, and gates, that protective boundary that's confirming, yes, I am the right device. Yes, I have authenticated this firmware. It's not been changed. It hasn't been muted. It's exactly what I expected it to be, and I'm going to allow it to start up. And then with that cyber resiliency I was telling you about, it also allows you to continually defend and protect when you see things trying to change that. Once the firmware is sound, then everything that rides on top of it, we can now do stronger authentication methods on. If you're familiar with Apple products, and I'm a big fan of Apple, I, I really, that's everything I use, iPhones, iPads, I'm doing this on a Mac. There's a chip called T2. It's their, uh, it's kind of their security engine. Uh, you'll never get the exact details on what's in there, but if you go look at a T2 product, you're going to see a lot of what I'm showing you right here. That's how they make these devices very, very resilient and tough. And more and more of that type of stuff is happening in other devices. If you look at the Google Titan chip, um, which they're putting in servers, it's a very similar type of device. And this is going to be the future for all devices. And so now I have, uh, I always like to do a video. Amit knows me. I, I I find that usually is a little bit of fun because I get tired of talking and you get tired of hearing me. Um, so with this, I'm going to show you a common attack that doesn't cost much. Um, and it's an easy way to get at those cryptographic keys. And again, why if you have a unique um, uh, identity and you have cyber resiliency, you'll protect against this. But I use this, it's called side channel attack, SCA. I use these side channel attacks where they're going to monitor power lines and they're going to use um, radio uh, equipment to actually very easily get at cryptographic keys in devices. And so one, the first one's going to be how you do it with power. You just measure power. So if you have a, a, a server or a laptop and you connect it up to the power lines on the chip that has the cryptographic keys in it, um, using this technique doesn't require you to open the part up or any of that. You just monitor the power lines. You can literally um, divine out the cryptographic key that protects everything in the system. And so this is a big deal. And then with the next round of attacks you're going to see, which are even more exciting, uh, this can be done using electromagnetic emanations. And in one case, you're looking inductively. You're using a loop of wire to put next to an iPhone. And then the one that's really scary that, that, that most people have no clue about is using what's called a Yagi antenna. It's a directed radio frequency uh, antenna. And you could have this on a wall behind someone. So you could be on your iPhone sitting in an office and there's a wall and behind the wall is a person with a Yagi pointing at your cell phone. And they can also pull out your cryptographic keys with that 
you weren't even giving them the phone, but you, you, were, you had no idea they did it. So I like to use this video to demonstrate. So I'm gonna play that now. Hi, my name is Elkin Wilder, and I'm an engineer working at Cryptography. Can you hear it? Is the audio good? Device uses secret cryptographic keys to protect sensitive data or transactions. Information about the secret keys can leak out from the device's power consumption or electromagnetic emission. Unfortunately, attackers can examine these leaks to recover the secret key. This is referred to as side channel analysis, and it can be implemented on any device that uses cryptography to protect its secrets, ranging from smart cards, SOCs, and FPGAs to mobile phones, tablets, PCs, and servers. Let's take a look at how side channel analysis works. This board includes an FPGA. FPGAs are programmable chips that are often used in systems for government, telecommunication, networking, and security. This development board is specifically designed to test the side channel resistance of cryptographic algorithms implemented in the fabric of the FPGA. We will begin by encrypting a block of data on the FPGA board by using the popular AES encryption. This encryption algorithm uses a 128-bit input and a 128-bit key, but internally it only processes them in 8-bit chunks. Since our plain text is much larger than 128 bits, the FPGA uses a common chaining mode. This generates a power consumption trace of 10,000 chained AES operations. If we zoom in on the scope and focus on an individual AES operation, we can clearly see the 10 rounds of AES. At each point in time, the power consumption depends on the activity and the intermediates that are being processed in a round. But since these traces are noisy, one single AES encryption will not give us enough information to reveal the secret key. However, if we combine multiple AES operations using statistical techniques, we can use them to check a series of key guesses and begin recovering the key. Focusing on 8 bits at a time, we'll look at the AES operation, which consists of three variables, the input, the key, and the SBOX table entry. If we guess 8 bits of the key and we know the 8 bits of input, we can predict the other variable, and we can correlate it against the 10,000 AES operations and the 10,000 corresponding ciphertexts. If the key guess was wrong, then the values being predicted are not related to anything that's being done within the FPGA. So there will be little to no correlation between the predictions and the power traces. If our key guess is correct, then the FPGA will process the correctly predicted intermediates. So the power traces should correlate with the predictions. Here we are predicting the eight bits that go into the 15th as box table lookup. This trace is a correlation for key guess equal to zero. And as you can see, the correlation is low. If we look at the correlations for the other key guesses, we will see that they are also low. But as the right key guess comes along, we see a big correlation peak. Once we have the 15 byte of the key, we can repeat this analysis using the same 10,000 traces for the key byte involved in the 14th S-box lookup, and so on, until we recover all 16 bytes of the key. Hi, my name is Gary Kenworthy, and I work in cryptography research. This is the electromagnetic, electromagnetic emanations part. We use encryption every day, electronic payments and banking transactions, encrypted storage, premium content protection. These are just a few of the applications in which our mobile phones, PDAs, and tablets use secret cryptographic keys to protect sensitive or secret information. At CRI, we set out to test mobile devices to see how secure these operations might be. We expected to find some leakage, but what surprised us was the extent to which these devices leak. These mobile devices all have radios for wireless communications, cellular, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and the like. But these radios are not the sources of the leaks that we're finding. In fact, we put the devices in airplane mode to turn all of the radios off. This unintentional electromagnetic radiation can be picked up using a common radio receiver. By digitizing and analyzing these signals, we can extract and decode the secret keys used in the cryptographic algorithms. 
Leakage signals can be picked up by a probe that's as simple as a loop of wire that responds to the magnetic field coming from the device. This wire loop is connected to the radio's antenna input. The radio intermediate frequency output is connected through a home build amplifier to an inexpensive digitizer. We've written our own application that calls standard crypto libraries and we've installed it on this phone. I'm now gonna make it run RSA operations in a loop. On the computer screen, we have several displays. This one shows the radio spectrum centered around the frequency that the radio is tuned to. As I move the probe around the phone, we see energy fluctuations of the magnetic field coming from the phone. When we see an interesting signal, we can tune the frequency and the position of the pickup loop to maximize the signal. We also adjust our bandwidth to give us a better display. Now we look at the signal in the time domain. This is like an oscilloscope. We can begin to see patterns in the signal. Notice the sharp vertical transitions representing sudden increases and decreases in radiated power. The two large power blocks with a short drop in the middle is a characteristic of the Chinese remainder theorem implementation of RSA. Zooming in on the individual operations, we discover even more. In this magnified time view, we again see sharp vertical transitions and varying durations of increased power radiation. We also notice that the duration of each pulse varies. This is the way that the signal that we are seeing reveals the secret bits of the key. The pattern reveals that each one in the secret exponent consists of a squaring step followed by a multiplication step, while a zero in the exponent involves only a squaring step. So with a single trace, we can directly read each of the secret bits and completely recover the secret key. This is the Yagi antenna. So this is the secret scariest cryptographic one. cryptographic keys can also be recovered from a distance. We will use this antenna connected to the input of our radio receiver. We've written our own application, which performs elliptic curve point multiplications, which are part of ECC cryptography. I'm now going to begin those operations in a loop. As the crypto has started, we can actually hear the operations. But it's also interesting that we can hear it and recover the secret key from a distance. The transitions we see here represent the double and add components of the elliptic curve operations. Looking at the plot, we can see that the double takes less time than the add. A double operation by itself represents a zero bit, and the double operation followed by an add represents a one. In being able to read this sequence, we can recover the entire secret key. So it's a little bit technical, but I wanted you guys to understand that cryptography is in trust. And you can see that uh, if you don't have what's called a hardware root of trust that protects and makes the device resilient, that cyber resiliency to these type of side channel attacks, that it's as simple as taking uh, basically an antenna and aiming it at your iPhone or your iPad or even your computer. And that could be done through a wall. So you don't even know there's someone on the other side snooping on your system. And now your cryptographic functions, your keys, the things that really you think are protecting everything can easily be extracted from the device and then used by a bad guy for whatever nefarious purposes they want. And so it's very important uh, and most people when they think about security, they only think about cryptography and then they're usually only thinking about application layer stuff. And uh, I use this kind of, uh, like I said, with executives and with people that aren't uh, kind of uh, aware of these things to really start to open uh, minds to the issues that are happening uh, at, a, at a very low level, at a silicon level. And, and why you need to have uh, really a root of trust, why you need to build at that foundational level to stop all these problems that occur. And also why that's now gonna become more of a compliance and mandated issue for many, many systems. Why leading edge companies like Apple and Google already have chips to deal with this. Um, and so that's kind of my high level introduction and I hope that you guys found it interesting. And uh, I'm very happy to take questions, have discussion. I think we're uh, maybe a few minutes early on the time you wanted. I think you guys wanted 15 minutes for Q&A. So you got almost 20. Yeah, this is great. Thank you so much, Eric.
think I, can you hear me now? We that, can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, awesome. Yeah, so uh, all the hardware in the world can't solve the problem of twisted ear, um, headphones. So. <laughs> yeah, so do we have questions from uh, our students in the audience or any of our faculty attendees? Shell, do we want to ask that they type them into the chat box? Yeah, I think actually given the number of participants, it's going to be difficult for if we if we have raised hands. So if you could use the chat box, that would be great. And I was wondering, Eric, just um, from the perspective of, of just a, a normal regular person, I don't know, where would you assess that our greatest vulnerability, our vulnerable vulnerabilities would be with our hardware? Right. Yeah, that's a very good question. It, it varies. Um, I think right now IoT is a big problem um, because you're taking historically unprotected closed systems and connecting them to the internet, right? And so there's a tremendous, you, you read about hacks and attacks at the app layer and denial of service, right? You see sites go down all the time. You see a lot of that. Um, but imagine now all these IoT devices, and then you probably read about, you know, people backdooring into baby cams and, and your, you know, your home security cameras turn into a spy camera for a hacker. Um, that, that's really all the IoT play. So I think IoT devices are going to become a, a big issue. And uh, the other one is autonomous things, right? So we are, we, we have a lot of drones flying around, you know, Amazon and now Walmart are going to be delivering with drones. Um, you have uh, Tesla autopilot. I mean, gosh, just, just the basic functionality of autopilot is enough problem. Imagine if hackers start to go with that thing, right? Um, you know, I, I've said for a long time, a great ransomware hit would be on Tesla to, you know, say, you know, Friday on a busy day in the afternoon, you know, on 280, we're going to shut down every Tesla on the road if, hey, Elon, you don't pay me a million dollars in Bitcoin, right? And so that's a possibility. These are not crazy things. These are real. And, and I think it's that new connectivity of uh, IoT devices and autonomous things that are going to be super vulnerable. And our infrastructure, particularly in um, power, is, a, is another place. So those are the areas where there's a lot of concern. Servers, believe it or not, they're kind of on the leading edge of this, that PFR standard, the, the Titan chip from uh, Google. You know, those guys actually are working this problem quite hard, but it's the proliferation of it now into these lower cost devices that are gonna be a part of, you know, connectivity on IoT where cost is very sensitive, so they don't wanna put anything in there to fix it. And then these new devices that are coming online where all the excitement is about, oh, I got a drone to deliver my stuff. Oh, I can go autopilot in my car. The focus is to get that feature out, right? The, the old Microsoft model, get it out there fast. Let right, the market share, yeah. It. And oh, security? No, I don't want to put that. So usually security is hard to get into these things until it's a mandate or compliance issue, right? Uh, again, people like Apple, people like Google, you know, the, the companies that are, you know, at the forefront and, and also they have a budget, they're willing to be earlier pioneers and, and get security in these things. But these other places, and I, I hate to say it this way, it, you know, after Tesla gets ransomware, if that ever happens, God forbid, I hope not, then they'll take it very seriously and something will be done. The government will maybe make it compliant. But, it, but that's probably where you'll see some of the bigger problems. And, and you're seeing pieces of that right now. Okay. Uh, I, I, can, I can give you a, an interesting example, too. I, I use this video once in a while, and this is uh, AP Miller Mas, M Maersk's uh, uh, attack. They got hit with a ransomware by accident. And, uh, you know, if you're familiar with uh, Maersk, you see all the shipping container ships. You've probably seen 20% yeah. of the world's commerce is done on Maersk um, containerized ships, right? They got hit with a ransomware and it literally shut them down for 10 days, right? They, they, they lost every single system. They had to rebuild 2,000 servers, um, thousands of uh, other devices. And they were only able to recover because they had a backup at a site in Africa that literally was not on, that was not online. It wasn't online, so it didn't yeah. get hit. It oh, so they online. And it, it propagated within hours and shut down their entire system. Um, and they actually had a pretty good cybersecurity program. They were in pretty good shape. And when you listen to the, their CEO talk about what happened to them, 
it's you know it's it's eye opening and he said it was a big eye opener for them and they now use what they've done and it's a cyber resilient process they took on what they've done uh, as kind of a, a good you know use case study for other companies but it, it cost them two hundred million dollars in that attack and they they weren't ransomed it was because the ransomware that targeted I think it was again in Ukraine targeted something else slipped into their system you know it's kind of like a virus right they they caught they caught the ransomware and it and it, and it took them down so it, wow that's a lot of damage from an accidental attack so i've got a specific question from a, a student attendee and then a more general question so the specific uh, question uh somebody else like me was really interested in these yagi antennas so are they available on the open market yeah if you so i i encourage you if you're interested in that kind of research um and not, i'm not going to encourage hacking but for research purposes of course uh, I would I would recommend looking into ham radio. The ham radio guys do this all the time. So you know, Google ham radio. Look at getting your ham radio license, and you'll find you can order these things on Amazon. And they're probably in the twenty to two hundred dollar range, depending on the quality of the antenna. Right, and then um, a more general question. So, how does the cybersecurity space anticipate or keep up with the attacks to prevent them from happening? They don't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have plenty of examples of, but there surely there must be examples of things that were maybe narrow misses that people learn from or that were um, anticipated somehow. Yeah, so, you know, we have a, a vulnerabilities database, uh, United States NIST got behind that, it's called CVE, uh, MITRE Corporation started at MITRE.org. Look, Google CVE, um, and you'll find that there is a, a, a basically a centralized hub database of all known vulnerabilities. So as people find, researchers find vulnerabilities or companies uh, get hit, they go and put that information into uh, this database. And, uh, you know, most uh, what I would call concerned companies are constantly looking at that database because anything can go in there. You don't have to be a company, any, any researcher, any person can feed it in, hey, we found this vulnerability. Um, the bigger thing, and this is the part I'm starting to work on with, with my company, is really applying uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, to uh, preventive situations. And so there are companies, and, and I have a relationship with one I promote called Dark Trace. If you get a chance, go check out Dark Trace. Um, this is a group of MI5 guys that uh, used a Cambridge algorithm to do self-learning at the enterprise level. So they have appliance they put in enterprises. And it literally does what they call a, uh, you know, it's an AI machine learning algorithm that gets kind of the uh, state of health of a network in a, in a system. And what they're looking for is basically pattern of life. How does that network work on a regular basis? It takes about eight days and it self-trains. This is the really great thing about AI and ML if it's done right. It can truly self-train. It doesn't need a human involved. And it builds its own model. And so within eight days, it's got a pattern of life for an entire enterprise. Now it's looking for abnormal behaviors and it can go to like these vulnerability databases. It can go and it can look for, and I call it a zero day uh, kind of, you know, forgive this analogy. I don't, I'm not a big fan of pre-crime. I think that's a crazy thing, but it is a bit of pre-crime where it knows, hey, because of all these vulnerabilities and because of my learning a pattern of life at this particular location, these couple of anomalies in these particular ways I think we might be having a zero day attack or we might be having a, the forming of an attack now. Uh, we need to do something. And this back to that cyber resilience I was telling you about. So now you're in a, a very intelligent, very quick reaction uh, uh, detects. Remember protect, detect, recover, detect mode. And then you can go and now do uh, a recover mode or a preventive mode and, and stop that attack. So AI and ML is the future of this stuff because we're not fast enough as humans to do it. It's got to be baked into machines. But that foundational level of silicon is always critical. Anything you build on has to have that first. And then you can start now layering on AI and ML uh, capabilities. All right, great. Um, all right, so another question from a student. How can you specify the time that the encryption is happening during the whole process of communication? Uh, and then power consumption varies with any process inside the processor. So how do you know when to point the antenna to pick up that specific key? 
Very good question. Sounds like you have a researcher in your audience. Um, so what, 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 what you're looking for, it, 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 so the, the whole idea with, and they call it, the, the, the word to Google is differential power analysis or DPA. Um, and so this is applied either in that electromagnetic spectrum or just on the power. The, the uh, differential part is what's key. And so what you're doing is you're collecting many, many traces over a long period of time. And usually uh, in a very weak system that has very little um, resistance to these attacks, you, you need about 10,000 to 50,000 traces. And once you have that, you're effectively um, using the, the differences in these functions where you know, you, you know the algorithm, we know what the algorithm is for AES, we know what it is for RSA or for elliptic curve. So we know the algorithm. We're now looking to see the pattern of that algorithm. So that's what you're, you're, you're gonna trigger on finding that pattern. Once you've found that pattern, then we're gonna look at it over multiple times. And uh, that differential part is where the multiple times you're gonna get uh, effectively an amplification. So you're able to very easily separate the signal from the noise. So you, you use the pattern to find your trigger point and then you do multiple traces to effectively do a, uh, it's, it's a, they call it a statistical process, it's a digital signal processing. You're just basically pulling out signal from the noise. All right, so um, Lisa's got a question that's kind of along the, the um, line of my question. So if students were interested in moving into this field, um, what kinds of projects would you recommend for their portfolio? Uh, so, you know, we have, uh, as she mentioned, students from EE, mechanical, computer engineering, industrial and systems engineering, technology, and then, you know, you were even getting into um, materials science when you were talking about the, the defects and the, the silicon, how everything is different. So, you know, what advice could you give to students about things to touch upon either through projects or, or coursework? Yeah, I think, I think, you know, cybersecurity is a very broad topic, right? And so I think for the students, you want to look at where your interests are. Um, so you want to align where your natural interests are. Um, if you're, you know, uh, a mechanical person, um, there's a lot of EE involved in this. So, uh, you know, you might want to be looking more at a physical tamper thing. So this might be something where you're trying to get at, okay, part of resilience is, is physical tamper, right? You know, uh, Tesla could be attacked by getting into that car. So there's all kinds of interesting work going on on physical tamper. Um, you know, there's, there's polymers, there's things that are making it difficult for you to, to break into a system. If you're on the EE side, then I, I definitely think you want to take a, a cryptography course so you, you really understand how that works. And then your electromagnetic courses and power courses are a big deal because you can see these side channel attacks at that level are huge. So understanding that as a foundation is important. But all of this, I would highly encourage looking into any of the classes you guys have there on cybersecurity. And I don't know if you have a, any classes today on uh, cyber resilience, but I would also encourage that as well. So, um, and if you're interested in, in, in having a class like that, I'd be happy to try to help you guys out with that too. Yeah, that's, that would be great. Um, so we could follow up on that afterwards. So a, a couple of specific questions and then um, a general question. So the, the specific, I'll, I'll try to combine them. So what exactly were the keys that were being hacked from the devices in the video you showed? And then somebody also wanted to know if the keys are continuously changing, will it lower the number of attacks? Yeah, so that you're getting into countermeasures on that key change thing. So in, in those uh, attacks you saw, they basically took what I would call open library algorithms. Um, in the first case, in the power analysis attack, it was AES, um, the advanced encryption standard, 128-bit key. That's what they used. And in the, uh, the loop antenna, they were using RSA which is a um, asymmetric. So AES is a symmetric cryptographic algorithm. Um, and that means that you have to protect the key. In the, uh, the two electromagnetic attacks, you're using an asymmetric cryptographic algorithm. And that's your public key cryptography where uh, you have a private and a public component. And so that's where you don't have to protect the keys. You can use the public component anywhere you want. Private key you protect, but it um, it's pretty cool technology. Uh, and in that case, the first one was RSA version of it. And in the second one with the Yagi antenna, they were using an elliptic curve. 
So those were the algorithms. And then as far as um, doing countermeasures, um, there's all kinds of ways to do countermeasures. Uh, it, there's tons of research done in that area. The most common one is kind of masking the operation or putting dummy operations in. So when you're running that cryptographic algorithm, you're randomly injecting extra steps so that when they, they, they don't get a trigger point and they never know what's the real step versus the fake step. And uh, that's a common way to, to mask it and make it difficult to attack because there's no way to get a, a correlation. There's no way to do that differential power because everything is moving noise. So that's a very common technique to, to stop the problem. Um, also, electromagnetic shielding is a great way to stop the problem. And then if you want some more interesting stuff on that, notice that whenever the US government um, uh, has, and you can see it happen at the Senate, you know, when they go in their special little chamber, they have to leave all their cell phones outside. Now you might understand why. All right, so um, an, another specific question, why is it not mandatory to design security mechanisms um, at the hard, in at the hardware level? Money. It's always down to money, right? And so this is, I call it Sivertson's law of attack. If the value of the thing that could be extracted from an attack is far greater than the cost of the attack, the probability of the attack occurring is 100%. If the value of what is being protected is significantly lower than the cost of the attack, probability is not zero, it will not be attacked, but it's very low. And so it's always a cost issue. And so for most people that provide a cell phone to you, they don't care if you get attacked. I hate to say it, but they don't. Um, and because it's not important to them. But notice, uh, at least with Apple, they do seem to care more. I'm not paid to say this, but I've noticed they do that. And part of that is because their business model, you know, they, they were able to get the movie studios and the record studios. This is how he made, most people don't realize that the very first iPhone was one of the most secure products on the planet. And it, they never said, this is the most secure iPhone you could get. What did they say? You can have songs for 99 cents. Because security usually doesn't, doesn't sell on its own. It's the enablement of something. And so in that case, uh, the reason it was very secure was because the movie studios and the record studios would have never given them songs for 99 cents because they were worried of piracy. So they had to prove it's super security. It's not going to get stolen, right? So it's always a cost function. It's really a cost function. And that's why you find the servers and you find these high-end pieces of equipment with a lot of critical stuff riding on it. They're going to spend the money to make them secure. But when you get down to your baby cam, sorry, you know, and, and, and that changes when attacks occur and compliance comes in, the government says you have to meet a certain requirement. Once that happens, then it all, it gets fixed. So. Yeah, so the last question is, is more general. Um, so, uh, you know, thinking back to the, the baby cams and the other things that we control as individuals, what precautions can we take to save um, ourselves from uh, cyber attacks? Yeah, I think the best thing is to, at, at your house, make sure you have a good firewall, right? Um, uh, you know, you want to be able to make it harder for, you know, stuff to come in. Do your research on the products, you know, look for what their security specifications are that they meet, ask questions about that, try to understand what's there. Um, and then, you know, I have a program called Little Snitch, L-I-T-T-L-E-S-N-I-T-C-H. You can look into that. Most people really look at the firewall, which stops what comes in. Little Snitch goes one step further and it stops what goes out and lets you set filters. And it's really amazing because when you go on a website, there's so many background spy things that are shooting data out. And this, this program actually gives you a warning. Hey, do you want to let this go to this site? And you can say no, it builds a rule. And now from then on, it won't let anything go out. And so I did a little test with my, just with my laptop and my browser. And I opened a bunch of tabs and I let little snitch run and I locked most of it down on the ads, just the, the snoop where to get data about you. And everything went like this. Then I turned it off so that everything could come on. And there was so much traffic going out that it slowed my machine down to go to from one tab to the other. So, um, you, you know, it's, it's just, we're, we live in a very snoopy environment. So you, you got to do a lot of extra work. Um, 
All right, great. So I think uh, we're at time. So I want to thank, uh, first I want to thank Eric for speaking today. That was a really interesting presentation. And I want to thank uh, our students and faculty for participating and supplying lots of really great questions. Uh, and just as a reminder, if it wasn't brought up at the beginning, uh, we have our GO program underway and uh, this um, participation in this uh, speaker series uh, gives you GO points. So please claim your GO points. And uh, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. I enjoyed it. Take care. All right, bye-bye.